One of the most solemn and yet glorious truth revealed in the Bible is that of the second coming of Christ. It's a message of hope to the sinful world and a statement for Christians and to the world that this is not our final home. Not taking away the importance of the first advent when Jesus came to this world to be the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. But this glorious truth was understood and preached thousands of years before there was the first advent of Christ, showing you the importance where it stands biblically as doctrines as far as God is concerned. I want to open up your Bible to uh, the book of Jude, Jude chapter 1. It's just for, before the book of Revelation, Jude chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 14. And it says, And Enoch also, meaning that Enoch here was not the only one, the seven from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Enoch, the seven from Adam, and others preached of that glorious day before there was even a first advent. This wonderful doctrine of the second coming of Christ was preached long before there was even a flood, and for many good reasons. The second coming of Christ would proclaim for us as Christians not to become familiar with this world, that we would remain as pilgrims and not to place our hopes and dreams in this current world that will, one way or another, disappoint us, whether it be through financial problems, sickness, betrayal in friendship or relationship, or death. Sooner or later, this world will serve its dish of woe of human misery to all of us, if it hasn't done so already. And no matter, and this world, no matter how much we tend to gain, it will leave us somehow dissatisfied. There's an interesting story about Solomon when he apostatized. To try to make himself happy, he tried different ideas of buying or making things. In other words, he could fulfill his dream to whatever he wanted to do, as he could afford anything he wanted. But no matter how much he bought, or built, or partook in abuse of substance, all these utopian ideas in trying to make yourself happy didn't last very long. Vanity was his final conclusion. But God didn't create us to be happy with materialism or utilization. He wanted us to keep us away from these disappointing results the world is guaranteed to give us. Instead, God gave his followers a wonderful gift to whatever circumstances you would go through, that above all, we as Christians would have one common hope, one common goal to deal with any crisis this world would have to offer, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Not very far away, just before the book of James. And we're going to read verses 8 and 9. The Bible says here, By faith Abraham, when he was called out into the place which he, should go, which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. Verse 9. By faith he sojourned into the land of, the, of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in a tabernacle with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. A well-known story to many of us, how Abram was called out of the city of Ur to become a nomad, a pilgrim, or a wanderer in a desert. But there's something interesting it says about this man of faith that was able to leave all his comforts of the world behind and willing to give his son to the altar of sacrifice. Come down to verse 15. It says, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had an opportunity to have returned. Did you get that? Did you just get what the Bible said about Abram and his family? Let's just read this in a modern translation. It says here, If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, 
they would have had an opportunity to return. Abram and his family would have found an opportunity to go back if they had a chance. Doomed to backslide, as we are all to doomed to backslide and turn our backs to God. Even Abram and his family would have returned had they the opportunity. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God that I love. That's our doom. But to keep us from going back into the world, to be able to give our hearts so God can seal it, God has given us a wonderful doctrine of inspiration to focus on something outside our one-dimensional thinking. And so to stop Abram and you and I from turning our hearts back into the world, we read in verse 10, For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's what kept Abram from turning his back to God and into the world. And friends, as a result, for Abram looking forward to a better world or the soon coming of Jesus, this is what God said about Abram in verse 16. But it says here in verse 16, But now they desired a better country, that is, and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. Friends, today we are told many different theories on how God will not be ashamed of us, and in many cases it will involve our bank accounts. But here, my Christians, brothers and sisters, for those that aim to the heavenly city or look forward to the soon coming of Jesus, the Bible says God is not to be ashamed to be called a, their God. The second coming of Christ brings hope to somebody that's suffering in pain or some complex illness and they don't know whether they're going to live or die. That in your terrible sickness, there's still a great hope. Come over to Job, Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. Job is in absolute agony of some unknown sudden disease that brings out painful boils. We know why, but he didn't know why. All Job knew he was healthy, wealthy and wise one day and the next day the whole world had collapsed. Job's world had been turned upside down. He lost his wealth, he lost his health and was left with no answers why these terrible calamities were happening. So terrible was the situation of doom that the only advice his wife could give him was to curse God and die, as it seems that the whole universe was against Job. But in his pain, in his terrible suffering and despair, forsaken by friends and families, Job held on to the most solemn, glorious and precious truth given to man by God, the second coming of Jesus. Let's read in verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand in the latter days upon the earth. Verse 26. And though after my skin worms destroyed his body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eye shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job wasn't completely left without answers. The one doctrine he could hold on to in his grief and pain was that of the second coming of Christ. And in this single doctrine, of hope, there's hope for all of us to give us strength when we're going through terrible sickness and calamities, to look forward to the soon coming of Christ when nothing else seems to make sense anymore. The second coming of Christ is hope for all those that are facing their final moments on the earth or have lo lost their loved ones, that we or they will live again. When it comes to grief from the sting of death, our hope lies in this very doctrine that there is a resurrection and Jesus will come again. Come over to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. And verses 19 to 21. Zara chapter 26 and verses 19 to 21. It says here, Thy dead men shall live, 
together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing. It's very interesting how many people will say, the first thing I'm going to do when I'm resurrected, but they never say this one. But the first thing we're going to be doing when we're resurrected is singing, according to this Bible verse here. Ye that dwell in the dust, for the dew is the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the death. And as far as dying is concerned, God says this to us. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself for a little moment until the indignation be passed over. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and there shall be no more covering her slain. The Bible says here to go and wait a little while in your chambers, meaning your graves. As we approach the end of time, this will be a comfort for many of us. Spirit of prophecy says they'll be put to rest before the terrible calamities will come upon this earth. And hence this beautiful promise that for all of us that are laid to rest, to wait in your chambers till it all comes to pass and God will awaken us to sing. The second coming in Christ are for all those that are in sorrow because they are left destitute. People see you as a nobody and treat you as a nobody. Trampled down, you long to be united with Christ and to put, never depart again. There's a wonderful illustration in the book of Song of Solomon's of an unworthy woman, her skin that has burned, thinking she's not attractive and mocked by everyone, treated with no respect by her mother's her sisters, and the village. But in all this, there's one thing that kept her going, and that was the return of her lover. No idea of the glory that was waiting for her as she was beaten and trampled down by everyone in the village. Then one day, trumpets were heard. The king came, not for all the upper-class people, but came for her, the outcast, a royal reception, a wonderful outward display of deliverance with royal soldiers. And one of the most beautiful chariots ever built all came just for her, the outcast. This story will parallel for all those that have been downtrodden and just long to be with Jesus. Banners of angels, trumpets will announce a rescue and one of the most beautiful chariots ever built will be waiting for you. Come over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. This story is found in Solomon, but it's rather long. It's a parallel. But this is a beautiful promise for you. If you feel downtrodden and you feel like a nobody, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. The Bible says here, let your heart not be troubled. Believe, ye believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Such was the hope when we read about the apostolic church. Such was the hope when we read about the church in the wilderness that all were rejected and persecuted by the world. And as well as the reformers, they all longed for the second coming of Christ. It's no wonder that the spirit of prophecy says this about the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. It says the doctrine of the second advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures because it opens up to the Bible student a solid platform of truth to prevent other deceptions in other areas of doctrines, such as the state of the dead, the doctrine of the resurrection, the new earth, baptism, the doctrine of sanctification that's illustrated in our baptism by dying and resurrected. The old life is buried and a new life that will imitate the life of Christ as we come up. All stems from the second coming of Christ. Even the Lord's Supper, friends, that deals with our forgiveness has the ultimate consummation. It looks forward to the soon return of Christ. And you cannot partake of this feast unless you desire the soon return of our Lord. The Bible says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you show the Lord's death till he comes. That's why it's so important to teach newcomers first about the Lord's Supper so they can fully appreciate this wonderful gift Jesus left us. Come over to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to verify some of the things we talked about before. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This chapter is talking about baptism, death, resurrection and the second coming of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to be reading verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Here is your baptism paralleling our death and resurrection. We die to Adam, but we are raised to Christ. There is... uh, uh, this is an important, it's important today, my brothers and sisters, to get baptised. I hear a lot these days, it's uh, not important, it's more important to have a relationship. But the Bible makes it very clear that baptism is an important part of your relationship with God. It's a covenant that you make with God, that not only you will make, uh, live a new life, but you will also be resurrected. And if it wasn't so important, why did Jesus insist to John the Baptist, who didn't need to get baptised, to go ahead and do it anyway? Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ you shall be made alive. You see here, baptism is signing your legal documents that you belong to the family of Christ that will guarantee your resurrection, but your father Adam will guarantee you death. And when is this contract finally fulfilled? Verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterwards they are Christ at his coming. You see, the whole symbolism of baptism is tied to Christ's second coming. Verse 24, 25 talks about something similar we read in Isaiah. And Jude also talks about the same thing on the next verse. It talks about a judgment that needs to take place, a pre-advent judgment which is uh, very scriptural. But uh, verse 26, very interesting. It says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Interestingly here, the Bible says that death is our enemy and one good reason to look forward to the soon coming of Christ. Friends, there are many denominations that see death as our friend because they have no understanding that there is a second coming that will put an end to the death, our enemy. And it's this doctrine, the second coming, that puts an end for it. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 16 to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. The Bible says here, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God. And the what? What's the next verse say? Next word. The dead, the dead shall rise, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain together shall be caught up with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be evermore with the Lord. And verse 18, it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Yes, friends, it's a doctrine where we can all be passionate about. It's a doctrine that will keep the weary pilgrim looking forward to a better place and to look forward for all the loved ones that have been put to rest to see them again. It raises up the downtrodden into indescribable glories that will be never taken away from them. Such a wonderful doctrine is the second coming and a list of doctrines that come out of this single belief is without measure. Truly, the second coming of Christ is the hope and glory for all Christians. Truly, the keynote of the sacred scriptures as stated by the spirit of prophecy. 
So it's not hard to understand when paganism came into the churches that believe in the immortality of the soul and which places the hope in this world and utilization that this doctrine quickly had to disappear from its teachings because the doctrine of the second coming of Christ was like a wall of protection that stood against many of these paganistic doctrines, such as the state of the dead, baptism, and many of these other doctrines which we just mentioned. So as time was, went on, less was heard about the soon coming and more about the traditions of the church to the point where it was a forgotten doctrine. Even today, many churches have no idea on the importance of the second coming of Christ, let alone teach it. The hope and glory for the sinful, suffering world that is left without answers. As this truth was downtrodden for a long period of time, we call the Dark Ages, many false doctrines could be introduced as Christians were left without hope. It wasn't until this wonderful Christian Bible student, William Miller, like no other, was able to reintroduce the soon coming or the imminent return of Christ to the world again. And when you see and understand the importance of these doctrines, it's no wonder that Satan would like nothing more than to silence this doctrine of the second coming of Christ. And it should be no mystery that this doctrine amongst our own namesake has been under attack for some time. One major misconception that's been taught by some is that the second coming of Christ is that the apostles taught that the Jesus would come back in their time. But one needs to understand, first the importance the Bible placed on this doctrine. And if the second coming was taught in the time of Enoch before the flood, why shouldn't the apostles teach it even with more passion and urgency than ever before, since the first advent had already been fulfilled? But there's one thing the apostolic church never taught, and that is that Jesus would come in their lifetime, because there was an important event that had to take place first. Come over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 2. The Bible says here, Now we beseech you, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, that you not be quickly shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by the epistles, as it is as if from us, saying that the day of Christ is present. You see, this was one of Satan's attacks long before you and I were born. And it seems there is nothing new under the sun that even today, Adventists can be shaken in their minds about the apostles teaching that Jesus would come in their lifetime. Friends, take it as a rebuke from God. Nothing like that was taught in their lifetime. Nor be troubled by spirit, nor by word, nor by the epistle, as from us saying the day of Christ is present. Verse 3. Do not let anyone deceive you by any means, because that day will not come unless the apostasy shall come first, and a man of sin shall be revealed, also known as the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Paul continues to reaffirm this in verse 5, where he says, Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? Paul says that the return of Jesus Christ could not take place till the man of sin was exposed. And that didn't happen until 1798 when Napoleon dethroned the Pope and all the other nations no longer wanted a defender because they had enough of a folly. In other words, her iniquity was exposed. But the greatest danger today is that we want to go to sleep concerning the imminent return of our Lord. No longer we like to hear this message, as some feel it's boring and obsolete. Come over to Second Peter, Second Peter chapter three. And we're going to read verses three and four. It says here, knowing first. There shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust. Verse 4, and saying, 
Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they were from the beginning of the creation. This verse is directly talking to seven day Venice, not to the world, not to other denominations. The Bible says here, knowing first that the, in the last day shall come scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his return? Friends, tell me something. What worldly person or religious organization believe in the second coming of Christ? There aren't many. But the home in a little bit further, it says, sorry, since the fathers fell asleep, People in the world might not believe in God, but just about every single person, worldly person, believes in the immortality of the soul. And so do many churches. All things continued as they were from the beginning of the creation. These people know our doctrine, the second coming of Christ, death being a state of sleep, and they believe in creation. Friends, the only church that can tick all these criteria is us. And the Bible says, those that see this message of the second coming, it, that it is old and obsolete, are called scoffers. But what these scoffers don't understand is that this doctrine is the very keynote to scriptures. Our hope and protection against apostasies that are ever so now slowly creeping into our churches. Oh friends, this is no time to fall asleep but to even get more excited than ever before, to hold dear this and preach this message of the imminent return of our Lord, <clears throat> to keep it before our eyes, our hope and glory, the return of the one who's the lover of the souls, our hope, our comfort, a guard against false doctrines, a doctrines that will help us to remain in a state of readiness in every generation. <clears throat> And like Adam, that we desire a better country that is and heavenly. And as a result, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called our God. It will be the ultimate day of deliverance for the downtrodden that will be raised to indescribable glories. Some think that we're going to be only singing in heaven or some picture of us floating on a cloud with a golden harp. But that's not true. We're going to be evangelists. And we're going to travel not to different countries, but different universes, different worlds, and teach the wonders of God's love. And all the secrets of the universe will be made available for us to study. From the same book, it says here, all the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed, unfettered by mortality, that wing their tireless flight to worlds afar. A little bit further, it says, they share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through the ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. Friends, become zealous again. Talk often about the soon return or our imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. When things are down or when you're going through sickness, let it be your meditation, your hope that God will come again and he will come and take us all home. Come over back again to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the chapter that talks about death and resurrection for our last verse and the coming of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as we conclude the sermon. And verse 58. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, as always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. May God grant us strength to all of us to what this verse commanded us to do, to be steadfast and unmovable when it comes to the second coming of Christ. Abounding in the word, work because the Lord will reward our labors and very soon Jesus will come again and give us a reward and take us to a home of undescribable glory to what Paul was forbidden to talk about and it shall be said in that day lo this is our God we have waited for him and he will save us this is the Lord we have waited for him we'll be glad 
and rejoice in his salvation. Maranatha. May we stand and sing our last hymn, 442. How sweet are the tidings that greet the pilgrims here as he wanders in exile from home. Soon, soon with the Savior in glory appear and soon with the kingdom come. He's coming, coming, coming soon I know. Coming back to this earth again And the weary pilgrims Will to glory go When the Savior comes to reign The mossy old grave Where the pilgrims sleep Shall be open as wide and the millions that sleep in the mighty deep shall live on this earth once more. He is coming, coming, coming soon, I know. Coming back to this earth again. And the weary pilgrims will to glory go when the Savior comes to reign. Then we meet near to part in a happy Eden home, sweet songs of redemption will sing. From the north, from the south, all the ransom shall come. And worship a heavenly King. He's coming, coming, coming soon, I know. Coming back to this earth again. And I will reap pilgrims with the glory go. When my Savior comes to reign. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia again. Soon if faithful we all shall be dead. Oh, be watchful, be hopeful, be joyful till then. And a crown of bright glory will wear. He's coming, coming, coming soon, I know. Coming back to this earth again. And I will read pilgrims will to glory go. When the Savior comes to reign. Let's just bow our heads. Our loving Father, what a wonderful truth you've given us. The soon coming of Jesus. And Lord, it's something we can be hopeful for. Not to be ashamed that we can uh, uh, every day meditate upon it. And to look forward to it when we are downtrodden. When we are uh, weary, Lord, let us look to you. Let us know that this world is not our world, but you have a far better world for us installed of indescribable glories. May this be our experience for all of us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>